This presentation is brought to you by Arizona State University's Julianne Wrigley Global Institute of Sustainability and a generous investment by Julianne Wrigley. Now, what is a good city then? I, there, I love a definition by Jan Gellers, a wonderful Danish urbanist, who says a good city is one where people like to be out in public space. Not in shopping malls, no, they won't want to stay at home uh, watching TV. They like to be out watching other people in plazas, in parks. Uh, that's what a, a good city is where rich and poor meet as equals in parks, in public transport, in uh, uh, so. We could survive inside an apartment, the same way a bird survives inside a cage. Uh, but we suppose the bird would be happier in a cage the size of this auditorium, and happier yet flying free. In the same way, maybe we are happier in a 10 meter wide sidewalk than in a 2 meter wide sidewalk. But here we come into something that is very interesting about cities. Cities are more architecture than engineering. Cities are more art. See, this ceiling could be at this height, you know, maybe 4 meters high, and we could be meeting here, and uh, functionally it would work, but we would feel something different in our heart, in our soul. We would feel different. Feeling is not irrelevant. In the same way, I cannot prove that it's better to have a 10 meter wide sidewalk than to have a 2 meter wide sidewalk. I cannot prove mathematically. This is not an engineering. This they will not teach you in an engineering course. This is something you will feel. So much about cities is subjective. The way, and unfortunately or fortunately, it's society that must make, through government, many decisions. I am very happy that some of the planners from the city are here. But for example, heights of buildings, 30 story high or two story high, there is no mathematical rule for this to be decided or not. And yet, we need to have this rule. We cannot let the private sector do whatever they want in their development, to make the sidewalk as big as they want when they do a building or to the height of, so, now. So, public space. Public space. We need also, in a good city, to have contact with nature, with water, with trees. A good city is good for vulnerable cities. I would say that a good city is one that is good for children, for the elderly, for the handicapped, for the poor. If it's good for them, it will tend to be good for everybody else. Almost, I would say that children and the elderly by themselves in public pedestrian space is almost a species, an indicator species for a good city. The same way that if we find water in a mountain and we find trout, is trout are indicator species that the water is clean. It has enough oxygen. So if a city is really good, you will find a lot of children in the street by themselves, not without the parents, not with their parents. This wonderful city like in the Netherlands, Groningen. Now, cars. Cars have two kinds of problems. One is quality of life. Cars kill people. It's not a minor problem, you know. Tens of thousands of people are killed by cars every year. But the other one is simply technical. You know, as cities are growing, is you can make room, all the room you want, and simply it's not possible to solve mobility with cars, as we will see, especially in the giant developing country cities. There is a conflict. We have to, we can design a city that is friendly to people, or a city that is friendly to cars, but you cannot do one that is both. This is simply there are conflicts. How do you distribute this space? I mean, this is, I mean, cars above, cars below, they were very nice to leave some space for people there. You know, high velocity roads, roads are like fences in a, in a field, in a pasture. You cannot go across, it's, so the more roads that you cannot cross, your freedom is restricted. You have noise, you have so, clearly it's less humane. It would be much nicer if this road was for human beings, if this road was just two lanes, and much nicer if it was pedestrian. I mean, maybe you need the road, but the fact is that it has a significant cost in human quality of life. If we tell a three-year-old child anywhere in the world today, watch out, a car, the child will jump in fright. And with a good reason, because there are tens of thousands of children who are killed by cars every year in the world. But the amazing thing is not that this happened. The amazing thing is that we think this is normal, that this is progress, that this is the way life is. This was not always like this. We have had cities for about 5,000 years. And for 5,000 years, I mean, maybe not on a bicycle, like in this old Chinese city. Uh, 
Any child could go, out, could go out without any fear of getting killed. It's only in the last 80 years that we have created human environments where people have to be afraid of dying. It's not a minor threat. This is progress. After 5,000 years, that's the best we can do. Some horrible streets. So we come out of the building, and then we find a street right in front where the children can get killed. Or we also, if we are not careful, this is normal, noisy, dangerous. This is the wonderful human environment we have created after, after 5,000 years of history. This is Tokyo in the Middle Ages. A child could walk without any fears, all, any blocks without any fear. Then Modena, for example, in Italy, let's see, very advanced society. Sometimes we tend to think that before cars we lived in caves. No. <laughs> 200 years before cars were invented, Beethoven had composed his music. You know, it was science, there was art. It was not like before cars, people lived in like, a, you know. This is Berlin, for example, it's, you know, people could walk. Paris, almost 1900, very sophisticated city. It was not exactly a, a cave, you know. <laughs> this is, and uh, so, New York, 1905. I think the 20th century will be remembered as a wrong detour in urban history. I think in 20, I hope that in 2,200 people will say, how, how could people in 2013 live? It was such a horrible place. <laughs> the same way we think today of London, 1800, as a terrible place to live, yet at, in 1800, London was the most admired city in the world, the most imitated city in the world. So this is what we have created, this uh, human habitats. This presentation is brought to you by Arizona State University's Julianne Wrigley Global Institute of Sustainability for educational and non-commercial use only.